paintings of biblical narratives, the lives of the saints, pro uh, prophets, apostles, and uh, in other churches they also have paintings of the uh, mysteries of the Holy Rosary. Like this one in Massey, in Sun uh the uh, parish of the Macro Conception. And uh, as we go further, in the transept, in the, in the uh, side eyes, usually the themes painted in, in, in those areas are continuation of the themes that were which, uh, the themes in, in the side altars. So there will be paintings of uh, saints that were also depicted uh, in the niches as well. But sometimes they will also uh, contain mostly scenes from the Holy Rosary, like this one in Honglao, painting of St. John Bosco. And in the Quarloff area, pretty much uh, noticeable that uh, familiar faces like St. Cecilia and uh, King David playing the harp, giving inspiration to uh, the choir as they sing the original songs. The holiest place, of course, in the, uh, in, in the whole sanctuary is the uh, chancel. Uh, paintings of uh, Godfather of the Holy Trinity, uh, the images of the Pantocrator, which dates back to the Byzantine period, um, as a, it's, it's a very persistent thing, usually being painted on the, on, on the uh, sanctuary area. And sometimes, they, um, in, in some places, they also paint uh, scenes from uh, the creation of the world and the fall of man. Like this one in Sibongan, it was very spectacular painting done by Francia. But, arguably, the most awe inspiring part would be the dome. The dome is where the realities of heaven are being presented. In supporting the dome, of course, usual dependents, which are the uh, portraits of uh, four evangelists. We'll discuss that further in detail later as I try to explain why these are placed that way. The usual style done on uh, several paintings on the country trade uh, is pretty much uh, illusionistic. It uh, creates uh, tricks into the eye. Uh, the style was employed in, uh, in, in several churches, tracing uh, from the very early roots in, in 1876 when Alvaro made the Painted uh, St. Augustine Church uh, is uh, Quadratura, uh, an Italian uh, style, uh, compartmentalizing each of, us, of, uh, of the whole parts of the ceiling into uh, four square fine spaces. And uh, the, the, it started with the uh, darker, somber um, composition uh, called Pisei. Uh, most of the uh, churches that uh, from from the late 18th, from the late 19th century up to uh, the early 20th century, were painted this way using simpler monochromatic color schemes, which is uh, somewhat practical for artists because of the largesse of the of the whole scene. It will be easier for them to uh, finish a whole um, ceiling painting in a shorter time, okay, as uh, compared to Renaissance paintings in Europe. In uh, other churches, uh, they also employ the technique of uh, Italian painting technique called the Soto in Su. Uh, it's Italian meaning seen from below, popularized by uh, Italian Renaissance painters Andrea Mantegna and Pozzo, Andrea Pozzo, where uh, the viewer is being checked into thinking that the ceiling is opening up into the heavens, into the sky, like this one in Kandun City, where a uh, very majestic painting of St. John Sahago being raised up to the heavens. Now, most of us, I mean, most, most of us, uh, yeah, in, in particular, Filipinos, in, in terms of art, we love to decorate every single space of, um, that can be uh, uh, painted. We have a special for Koro Pakui, or Fear of Empty Space, but it's not the case with some uh, paintings, like uh, in this one in Lazi, in the uh, more simple styles and way. Now, uh, of course, you may think that uh, some of the paintings might look original, but uh, time and again, history will tell us that uh, the 
painters back then tried to uh, use several sources, copies, they usually uh, use mass cards, some pitas, and different uh, and engraved paintings from, uh, from, uh, from Western painters. Like this one, a painting by Marc Antonio Franceschini, uh, painted this very beautiful um, painting of uh, the death of St. Joseph. And what do we know? Raymond France actually used it in one of his paintings in the video. <laughs> it's not a copy. So. And as time went on, as uh, artists tried to uh, have their own style, anachronistic elements have also been incorporated as well. Uh, this one in, in Albu, in Bohol, um, although it's, some parts have already been lost. This is a, a painting of uh, St. John the Baptist preaching to the, uh, to the crowd. Uh, for telling the uh, coming of Jesus Christ, but if you look closely at the uh, uh, at the picture, John the Baptist is preaching to a group of people coming from different races. You can see a Japanese woman there, a Semitic man, an Indian, a Caucasian. It illustrates the uh, um, it illustrates God's message for the whole world, for the whole mankind. Now, let's uh, discuss now the, the history, the evolution of uh, art in Sealy paintings. When the missionaries first came here, and uh, when, when, uh, when, when the Spanish parishes established uh, uh, parishes and built churches, art uh, is somewhat primitive at that time, but um, with, with the help of uh, many uh, friars who uh, tried to teach their, the natives, um, soon enough, the natives try to, uh, to develop and hone their, uh, their craft in painting. Uh, although, it first started with um, folksy uh, styles. Uh, there's still a lot of provincial flair uh, in, in styles of uh, interior decoration. Like this uh, um, painting, in, ceiling painting in, uh, in the Carvel photo from Pamplona and Trevea. Uh, it tried to portray uh, an artesonado style and with four motives. Now, as as uh, art progressed in the uh, late and from the 17th to the late 19th century, when art became more formal, when schools were established to formalize that discipline. Uh, artists have become more influenced with Western styles. And, of course, that's uh, with, with, with any art, secular or religious. Uh, we can say that most of the uh, influences came from, uh, from, from our Western counterparts. But in terms of uh, seeing art, okay, although there, it's pretty much uh, Baroque and uh, we're still uh, enjoying the effects of the Counter-Reformation, I am trying to establish here a very strong link between seating art and Italian opera scenography. Uh, most of the Italian opera houses back in uh, back in the 18th like back in the 19th century uh, that was um, the golden art. I mean, the golden era of uh, of Italian opera, where they tried to really depict realism in, in their backdrops and even in uh, in Theater decoration. As you can see, this uh, archival photo from Gabriel Fenice in, in 1837. The interiors are pretty much similar to what was done in uh, San Agustin and in a lot of other uh, opera houses. And, and still uh, doing my research on that, creating that strong link between Italian opera scenography and, and CD art. After all, most of our first uh, CD painters at that time. After Adeloni, were actually scenographers who did telon and uh, backdrops and stage plays and as well as and comedias. And uh, that's what uh, they did um, in 1876 when the Italian opera group, uh, when so many Italian operas uh, went outside Europe and even reached uh, as far as Asia because of the opening of the Suez Canal in 1861, uh, some opera. Uh, Troops went uh, went forward, and uh, a particular uh, 
cooperative named Compañía Aspenadis. We share together with the two talent sonographers, Cesar Alderoni and Giovanni Gabella, who was commissioned by the Cura of the San Agustin Church to paint this beautiful uh, quadrature of the voice style in, in the ceiling of a uh, church, and which still persists up to today. When, it was, when the painting was inaugurated in 1876, there was mixed reaction from several people. Though people were really awed by, by the uh, illusionistic effect, others commented that there's a lack of, you know, of, uh, of uh, lack of uh, that alone. I mean, this, uh, this um, work opened a new sensibility and new appreciation for church interior decoration. Soon thereafter, a lot of other um, a lot of other churches tried to copy and follow suit. One of the uh, students of Alderoni de Bella, who went on to become one of the most famous sonographers during the American era, was Toribio Antillon, hailing from San Juan de La Union, who went on to uh, do several backdrops of the Soyas and Comedias and painted the ceiling paintings of several churches in Tantangas, in Bicol, in Pampanga, and some churches in Manila, and probably in his, in his home and provinces in Ilocos as well. One of his early works is here, and in the following result, the whole church report was bombed during the war. So there, um, time went on, maraming mga simbahan pa na, ano, nagkopia, and I would like to say that Around the 1920s up to before the war, that was the golden era. I would like to turn that one. Golden era of seating art. As the movement went on, went to the Besides area. And as we know, if you guys have been going around Besides, in particular in Sibuin Hall, you've seen the interior decorations of those churches. And you know for a fact that uh, there are two known, um, there, there are two names that you can mention in terms of seeing art. Raymond de Francia, with the most of all, and Canuto Abela, his uh, um, best friend. He, he, they're actually best friends and they're, they're buddies. They did, uh, yeah, they, they did help in some churches. They, they, they're like a tag team. So, um, I'd like to ask you, has anyone uh, went around the hall? And uh, who, who among here went around the hall? Can you raise your hands, please? <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with Raimundo Francia, right? The one who painted those majestic ceiling paintings in Bohol and in Cebu. Okay. I'm pretty sure we have heard it somewhere before, but I'd like to ask you this. Has someone ever got to know? what his image looked like. No one has actually seen where has uh, they, they knew where the France by name, but no one has actually seen an image of him. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor with the, with the blessing of the Francia family to introduce to you the great genius. This is Raymond de Francia. This is the only known an existing picture that uh, survived. He, uh, he was able to paint several churches in Rensipu and Bohol. And without him, we did, I'm not doing this, without him, you were the be in my enjoyable. And I believe at this very moment, right now, I believe he deserves a great round of applause. Can you guys give a big hand for him? Thank you. So, after the war, he uh, somehow slowed down. Um, but uh, in, in the 1920s and the 1930s, he went on to paint around 80% of all the churches in Bohol and some parts in Cebu, southern parts. And he probably had done some other churches in Samara and Lake as well, that I still have to uh, establish. Um, after the war, uh, 
new parishes are starting to uh, be established, in, especially in the hinterlands. Uh, and somehow those uh, little parishes that were, um, that were built, the little chapels that were built in the remote areas, in the mountainous areas, particularly in Bohol, um, they somehow wanted to bring the grandeur of their mother parishes, if only at a smaller scale. In some uh, parish, uh, parish chapels, particularly in the towns of Kutigon, Maripuho, and Albur, they tried to copy the styles of their many fans as well, like this one in um, the chapel of Barangay Pusong in Kutigon. A certain artist named Pongkol del Moro. Pongkol in Boholang means because he's an MPD. Yeah, uh, his left arm was amputated, but um, I talked to uh, one of the old uh, natives there. He remembered uh, painting uh, those very small parishes uh, in, in, in the in Barangay uh, Kahaya, Kawayanan, Nolibagdad, Botsongon, in, uh, in other uh, parishes as well, and in some nearby towns. So this, uh, although it's not as polished as uh, the words of Francia, but even those, you know, it's, it's really inspiring. It's, it's interesting to note that even those smallest chapels had these works of art. In the 1970s onwards, as the uh, scene started to experience some damage to the elements, and of course there, there had been um, of course, um, efforts by the parish to uh, start uh, renovating their ch uh, churches according to modern styles, Ceiling paintings have also um, were affected by those restorations or renovations. Uh, like this one in uh, Basilica de San Domingo, uh, the original work of Canuta Avila were whitewashed and had been um, replaced with a newer painting sometime in 1965 at the time when they were preparing for that church to be, uh, yeah, to be part of the 400th uh, uh, anniversary of the coming of Christianity. Back in, back in that year. In uh, the 80s, uh, this church in that is done by Makario um, Ligon in 1937, uh, was been restored in 1984 to 1985 by his student, Victor Ramos. And somehow they were able to retain the original works. Some are not lucky though, uh, like this one in, in Betalo. Uh, this this uh, parish in San Fernando in Cebu. The works of Raimundo Francia have been uh, replaced by, by, I mean, retouched by, uh, by uh, a certain Pat Arcaya back in 1989 and somehow lost the original intent of, of, of Francia. In 1991, when uh, the uh, parish of Indang in Cavite had this restoration project for the church. They also tried to uh, they also tried to uh, uh, attempt repairing and uh, replacing the original seating. And a certain David Sierra created a proposal for the design for the new design. But fortunately, the parish priest disapproved of the project, and instead he he told David Sierra to just retouch and restore the lost parts. And so we can still enjoy the original work there in that church. Uh, time went on in, in the 90s. Some churches have uh, you know, experienced uh, uh, damages from several calamities, earthquakes, typhoons, fires. With, uh, uh, with renovations, of course, they tried to employ local artists to recut or replace uh, the losses. And uh, they started to fix their own signatures as well, like this one in Lobo in uh, uh, 1995 when uh, Chris Navarota uh, did some uh, restoration work in, in that church. And also, when uh, during the Great Earthquake in 1990, when uh, uh, the, the churches of Hagna, Dimiao, and uh, Noai were damaged. Uh, the uh, celebrated artist of Sari or Peace was commissioned to uh, repaint or uh, reconstruct some of the lost parts of the, uh, the scenes of those churches. And they, they even tried to uh, uh, fix their, their, uh, their names as well and some inconspicuous parts. 
Well, yeah, that's for some churches in uh, in Bohol. Now this lucky is this one in Bacalayon. And uh, you may have heard of this controversial project back in 95 when they, <laughs> they uh, well, removed the original Alfonso works. And uh, I'm not going to show the damaging them, but what was still retained is uh, uh, on the transit done by uh, Max Ayaay in the, in the 50s. So, oh, let's play a game. To make things a little more interesting, let's have a nice figure. I'll show some archival photos like this one and try to guess which church is it from. I'm trying to uh, show here how many churches we have lost already, or how many scene paintings have we you know, have been lost through the years. Can anyone guess where this church is from? You're right. <laughs> That's a Canuto Avila work, by the way. This one. <laughs> so, Nikki? No. Minalin. But I've been done by Kuri Vendero as well. He did several churches. Uh, he did several paintings in Pampanga. Ah, this is pretty interesting. This was damaged by an earthquake back in 1946. Only the ruins there remain. But this is very beautiful. Somewhere in the besides. Yeah, anyway, you need it. Oh, this one. This was loaded by Dr. Rosa Rizal himself when he had his stuff over in this church on his way to his aborted mission in, uh, in 1896, going back from this place. He noted in his travel diaries that when he viewed this church, he had some, he'd seen some silly paintings that were inspired by the works of French artist Gustave Gore. Follow. Oh, this is a recent one. 1995. There is one dedicated thing from this church, I guess. I'm dying. Ah, uh, this one as well. Very beautiful. Clue. This was recently raised by fire the day after Christmas last year. Simpsons. Simpsons. And this one. Hawaii, Hawaii, Hawaii. An interesting fact, the Bella was sent from Manila all the way to Hawaii in 1896, sometime around that time, to uh, create the same thing as well. I'll show some more. Aguila, Pangasinan, we have Alimudian, Pacolot City. I'm not sure if you can see them. Kalumpit. This is a the ceiling paintings. Karka, uh, what we see right now is not the original. Mm -hmm. Lubao Kumpanga. Koton. No longer there. Pasi. And Kototan. Church there in St. Carlos University. They've been done there in Avila as well. San Fernando Pampanga, Santo Tomas, and Taal. Work by Torigantino too, but uh, what we see right now is different, but somehow I try to regain the nostalgic feel that we could say in the Puerto uh, Tura style employed by Antonio. So today, you might think that there are some churches that do not do this anymore, but they still do. In fact, some churches still try to uh, plan or try to create their own paintings. But just like today's painters, just like Francia, Avila, and Dillon, they were also inspired by the predecessors back in those times. Like this one in uh, Pinondo. 
paintings from uh, from from works uh, copied from the works of uh, Rembrandt, Titian, uh, Rubens, or the founder depicting the uh, the histories of the Holy Rosary. Mm. Okay, so. <laughs> this one, okay. Although you may say it's a facsimile of the Sistine Chapel, but try to look. Try to look at some of the elements that made it more unique and more local. Instead of the usual um, play of lines and shadows to create a what a tourist style, they employed the use of bamboo to compartmentalize for a to create sections and incorporate scenes from the Filipino Catholic traditions like uh, the Oración, the uh, Santa Cruzan, the Pasión, the Flagellation during Holy Week, and so much more. Uh, this one, a recent work, but um, for, from, a, from, a, from an untrained eye, you might think that this could have been done by a high school student, even a high school student. But hey, um, if you try to observe those paintings, these are actually the seven sacraments all around the, uh, the nave, juxtaposed in, um, in the modern way of Christian living in that parish. So that's how they want to express their faith through these paintings. And as recent as last Holy Monday, I visited this church in Katanawan. The uh, placing of uh, the traditional placing of, the, of some uh, uh, some uh, paintings in, in the whole scheme have, been, have deviated from the from the traditional. Usually, when you uh, when you place four evangelists. Uh, uh, on the uh, uh, on the ped pedantus around the dome. Instead, they place all those four evangelists in a linear fashion along the whole length of the nave. It was recently finished last uh, March 25th, and we have here the artist who did this church. I would like to call Van Vita Rosas. Can you please stand up? Beautiful. Thank you. And Father Lucas. Here as well. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, the history. And art is still evolving. We may see newer works, but inspired largely by older works as well. So let's focus now on the uh, on the aspect where we try to interpret these paintings through iconography, symbology and uh, even certain things that would uh, make us realize that these paintings also reflect our way of lives here, in, in particular here in our country. Of course, uh, in art, as St. Thomas Aquinas said, man did not understand without images, and that's pretty much uh, the main objective of, of, uh, of visual arts in, in Catholic tradition. But, um, in seeing art as well, uh, mostly, portrayals of heaven are, are incorporated. One of the uh, seemingly complicated doctrines of, Catholic, of the Catholic Church is the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. How do you explain to the natives the divine nature of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit as three personas in one God? So the use of an equilateral triangle and the mercy seat inside. The viewer may be able to understand a little more easier that doctrine through this uh, visual uh, symbol of the, uh, the triangle. The usual uh, of the, uh, how full the Trinity is being portrayed. Most uh, paintings also um, depict the, the life We'll see the earthly life of Jesus Christ, and just to you know, just to uh, get the message across or state a point, some some of the parables were trying to look very obvious, like this one in uh, Maribuho, where you you see um, a number of them around the hall, Jesus handing a literal key to Peter, the keys to the kingdom. Although there are some works that also uh, try to portray the divine nature. of Jesus Christ, as seen in this uh, painting of the Transfiguration. In many Orient churches around the country, 
several themes attributed to the Virgin Mary are incorporated in single paintings. But in this particular example here in uh, Laos, um, this painting is the painting of the presentation of Mary in the Temple, which is not found in biblical text, but rather in apocryphal text. So, it's interesting to note how the artists in the parish piece have a very wide understanding of, uh, of the Virgin Mary, even as far as incorporating um, the, the, the uh, uh, legendary texts that are not uh, incorporated in, in the Bible as we know today. So, yeah, and a lot of other paintings in, in modern churches, particularly in Bohol. Uh, yeah. Uh, paintings of uh, prophets, apostles, and uh, the patriarchs are also uh, found. And usually they are painted with uh, symbols or scenes attributed to them. Like this one, uh, the uh, painting of Jonah and the whale. You can identify Jonah with the whale, of course. <laughs> and of course, uh, Lives of the Saints as well. Although most churches uh, painted uh, saints from the ancient and medieval times. Some churches as well try to uh, incorporate uh, portraits of modern day saints, like this uh, painting of Santa Teresita, of uh, the Nino Jesus in Pasay, in Sama. Only the, uh, the, part of, I mean, the uh, transit area and the remain, the rest of the whole uh, ceiling, the transit and the day have been lost as well. Angels, in particular, they're everywhere. They're, they're pretty much found in almost every single painting. Now, although not all uh, not all angels, not not uh, not the whole hierarchy of angels were uh, portrayed. Mostly, uh, cherubims, uh, archangels, and guardian angels are found in in city art, like this one in uh, Lucena City in, in the Apps area. Uh, a typical example of the Soto in Su, uh, where cherubs and childlike figures are, are painted. Although there are also paintings that portray a more accurate description of angels, like this one in Argao in Cebu, painting of a cherub being placed by God's guard, the tree of life, after the fall of man. And of course, guardian angels, they're also there. This is a uh, picture I found from uh, a magazine from uh, the magazine Cultura Social back in November 1931. That was from the USC archives. I uh, don't know who the artist is, but this is a copy used by the Mundo Francia in Balibihai and Bohol. So if there are angels, of course there are demons. <laughs> so, yeah. Demons are usually portrayed in, in their grotesque animal-like figures. Usually, they are um, uh, they are portrayed as such because of uh, the, popu uh, the popular work by Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy. But the those those forms can can be traced back to a much earlier ecclesiastical account of Saint Athanasius of Alexandria, who recounted the life of Saint Anthony of Egypt. Oh, sorry. Yeah, recounting the uh, the uh, temptations of Saint Anthony as he experienced uh, while he went went fasting for a long time in, in the desert, and he uh, he was uh, tempted by the demons and several animal-like figures. This one in Inabanga in Bohol. In less, uh, lesser known uh, works, also uh, portray virtues and vices in Indalaget in Cebu. Uh, there are two paintings of La Templanza and La Fortaleza facing each other. The vices, they're pretty much around. Um, that will be, uh, I'll show you more. Uh, most of it done by, uh, by Francia and the use uh, certain specific styles and portraying the vices. Invariably, other churches also try to uh, paint some historical events that are significant to the life of the parish, like this one in Novo in Bohol, where the or maybe of Guadalupe appeared in an apparition during the Great Flood in November 26, 1876. In Balilihan, yeah, in Balilihan, there also is uh, 
painting of the court of arms of the 33rd International Eucharistic Congress back in 1937 is found in the dome. Now, that's what I'm telling you earlier. Raymond Francia, specifically and arguably the only uh, the technique only done by Francia himself, he used uh, composite painting, uh, usually employing two subjects, two or more subjects to convey a particular message. You would see this one in so many churches around the world, the good and bad confession. So you can see on the left a woman being dragged by the devil while an angel is flying away in despair. Uh, while well, she's making a bad confession. On the, on the right side, a man being led by an angel when the devil is being defeated. That's how the parish wants to uh, uh, teach the parishioners how to make a good confession. This painting in Anda, in Mohol, titled Santificar las Festas, uh, it's another composite painting where the upper side um, portrays a solemn celebration of a feast of a patron saint. And the other one, a uh, uh, painting of a deep decadent celebration. And he superimposed here an image of hell as a consequence of not properly celebrating the holidays. Oh, okay, this one. <laughs> I'm sure uh, Sir Ricky is pretty much uh, amused with this. This painting, Mota de Sente in Fondi and in Church of Gaza in Bohol. Uh, they're placed, they're, they're two paintings placed side by side. A painting of a woman uh, in, in, just in a white gown in deity while an angel is being, let, let, leading her to the house of prayer. And that is Mota de Sente, which in Spanish is really, we see translated as proper dress or decent dressing. So if there is Mota de Sente, what could be the opposite? In Spanish. <laughs> More than the same thing. <laughs> See? <laughs> so, a uh, painting of a, a, wo a woman sleeveless and, uh, yeah, dressed in sleeveless red dress, splendid of indecent passions in the world, and the devil letting, leading her to serpent away from the and it's pretty interesting how these problems before still is prevalent up to today. The problem of not wearing proper dress during mass. In church stores, posters of what to dress and what not to dress. It's still it, it, it's interesting how these problems were, you know, prevalent problems before. So um, yeah, that's uh, the sort of part of uh, symbology and British interpretation. In symbols, mm, there's so many of them. Symbols are also uh, used to uh, uh, to convey a particular uh, meaning. The usual for, uh, symbol uh, of Jesus Christ is uh, the Adam's day, uh, a, a lamb placed on top of a book and transfixed with an arrow, as is found in this. Uh, Particularly in this church in D1, in Mr. Tamar. Other uh, portrayals of Jesus Christ are uh, is, uh, other symbols used to, uh, to portray Jesus Christ as a symbol of the pelican, uh, the legendary pelican where the, the, the mother pelican wounds her breast to use her flesh to feed her young, which symbolizes uh, Christ's sacrifice. Hmm. What's happening? Uh, okay. In uh, Marian symbology as well, uh, there are other churches that have uh, there, there are churches that uh, employ Marian symbols, particularly uh, the invocations of the litany, litany of Loreto. Um, we see this uh, church in Bolho and in Cebu, where there are symbols of the Ark of the Covenant, the House of um, the House of Gold, the, uh, the Tower of David, the Tower of Ivory, the Morning Star, and other Marian symbols found there as well. In those particularly. The heavenly host is usually uh, painted in the ceiling dome. But you may ask me, why, why only the dome? Okay? Why not paint the heavenly host in other places, in the, in the nave, in the, in the transit area? This is where symbology comes into play as well. In Christian symbology, the symbol of the circle, 
is a symbol of heaven or perfection. And that's the reality of heaven. And usually they they, 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 they uh, try to depict uh, the heavenly host, the, uh, the communion of saints, the Holy Trinity and the angels around the dome. And in this uh, basilica in the Tangas, the uh, shape of the octagon, which is uh, the middle shape between the this, this circle, which is the symbol of heaven, and uh, the square, symbol of earth. And the, the middle the, the middle man between heaven and earth is Jesus, uh, is Jesus Christ, that is what the symbology of the octagon is. And supporting the octagon is a four evangelist supporting the uh, yeah with their texts are the uh, the uh, foundations of the uh, celebrated mission of Jesus Christ and as you can um, you will notice on, on this dome there are eight slices with the number eight affixed on each of the slices and in numerology Christian numerology number eight means infinity and you can just imagine why they looked at the, the once you know the parish priest there want to uh, replicate perfection and infinity in the dome. That's you know, try to just to make the message across. And in other uh, churches there are also uh, lesser you know, lesser subtle uh, symbols. They were like semiotics. Uh, like this church in Kalkar in Cebu, uh, the symbol of the rose, which is a symbol of the martyrdom of uh, St. Catherine of Alexandria. Uh, rose -like symbols are found all around the, uh, the nave. And again, back in uh, the usually they also employ text. The uh, Myron Mor monogram memory is, uh, is found at the center of the, uh, of the transit crossing. But you also need to, we also have to take notes the uh, choice of colors of the artists, particularly with, with this one. Um, the color white, symbol of purity, color blue is associated with the Virgin Mary, and the color yellow or the color gold, which artists know for a fact that the color gold creates a physiological effect to the viewer. It creates a, a, a feeling of transcendence in, in awe, which is again um, what the reality of heaven is. <laughs> okay, now this I only got to uh, research two days ago. You may think uh, that spiral dome is just painted there for for art's sake. Try to notice. There are several other symbols of, uh, there are several Christian symbols, even, even in other non-Christian uh, religions. They use the, same, the symbol of the spiral, like the spiral of the yin and yang. The swastika from the uh, Syrian Empire. And the uh, Jacob's Ladder, the spiral staircase. The symbol of the spiral is the metaphor of symbolic. I mean, the, the, the metaphor of spiritual journey. Spiritual journey leading us to the very end, or the, the very objective, which is at the very center of that moment is Jesus Christ, JHS. This is how our spiritual journey should be. It might look like a, you know, a, a, a typhoon or an iris or what. <laughs> you know, come to think of it, spiritual journey is very turbulent. It could be very turbulent. But we should all be led to the very end of this spiritual journey, being one with Jesus Christ. Pretty nice, huh? Okay. So yeah, that's that's the part of my uh, of discussion. Now, uh, an important part of my study as well is uh, how these parishes are preserving and uh, doing conservation work in, in some of the uh, parishes. Um, of, uh, and throughout my study, there have been three um, important and significant um, projects that have contributed to this uh, to the study I'm doing. One is the uh, restoration work by the National Museum done in 2009 in the church in uh, Jimenez, uh, where the paintings done in textile done by a, a Spanish artist back in 1896 still remains up to today. 
Meron po si Payne uh, Sobre, Francia, uh, technical study done by the University of Melbourne, uh, one of, by one of the colleagues of Dr. Um, Nicole Tse, uh, also contributed to my study. And the ongoing work is being done on the uh, uh, wall and ceiling paintings in the steel church of San Sebastian Basilica, done by San Sebastian Basilica Conservation and Development Foundation. The usual uh, problem that we encounter in several churches in, in, in Bohol, and particularly in, in paintings done on steel sheets, is uh, you know, holes and losses due to rusting and corrosion, uh, like this church in Vila, and more severe uh, in, in the churches of Loon and Inabanga and, and in Albur, where so many of the uh, ceilings are deteriorating. I'm pretty sure a lot of other churches have also this, uh, uh, in, in Bohol have this problem as well. Primarily caused by an, an, an inadequate and uh, neglected roof system that contributed to, uh, to water leakage, um, fluctuations of temperature, humidity, and other factors, and the elements as well. And, and th the whole church structure would, would contribute to the uh, damage and decay of these paintings. Some churches like this one um, try to patch loss by just veneering those holes, but of course it looks very unappealing, visually, aesthetically unappealing. So this is not like the end um, remedy. It's, it should be, you know, it, it shouldn't be a temporary remedy. We have to fill the patches and restore the lost works, of course. This painting, uh, I mean, this uh, church in Santa Maria, Love Sur, used to have a very beautiful uh, painting of the Holy Rosary around the perimeter of the ceiling. And in other churches, in Sinai, in Santa Cruz, in uh, San Esteban, have the paintings of the Holy Rosary as well. This picture was taken back in 2005. And this is how it looks like today. I'm talking about the UNESCO World Heritage Site here. Okay? <laughs> so, um, you know, you can just imagine these, uh, you know, those priests uh, or some, some communities are not being guided properly on how they have to, uh, you know, do some renovation works in their churches. Why should they whitewash a very beautiful painting of the Holy Rosary? I'm, my guess is as good as mine, and as good as yours. So, uh, this one as well in San, San Sebastian, you can see the damage over over a long period of time. The uh, the paintings done by um, Lorenzo Rocha, Felix Martinez, um, a lot of chipping off and flicking off of the paint, exposing the uh, steel, which causes further corrosion and expansion of the metal, which creates further flicking off. It, can be a very, very vicious cycle and destructive as well. So if, if, if not treated right away or immediately, we can just imagine in the next few years, I don't know. So we, we really have to act on this immediately. Now, uh, today the San Sebastian Conserva Conservation Development Foundation is doing a lot of extensive studies funded by several agencies on uh, assessing the condition of those paintings. Like this, uh, Conditional survey uh, from uh, from one of the uh, uh, niche paintings. So you can see the areas where there's lots of accretion, corrosion, rusting, amalgamation of uh, of uh, the uh, paint and, and, and paint layers and other damages. Now um, I'll show you five panels in San Sebastian Basilica. This one uh, by uh, Mitch, uh, the niche of Blessed Francisco de Jesus. Uh, the one by San Nicolas de Tolentino. A painting in Santa Rita de Casilla, San Agustin, and Santa Monica. One of them, back in sometime in the 1990s, uh, there was a re restoration work done in, in the Basilica. They tried to apply uh, a particular coating, dark dark varnish in some of them. Which do you think 
Which one of these things do you think had been applied with Dahmer Carlos? Why? Why? Why do you think? Well, I'm just assuming you want to make a point that it's the worst thing. Mm, okay. Pretty good observation. But actually, it was the middle painting, Santa Rita de Casilla. If you will notice, all of, out of those five paintings, only one was you know, more vivid in color. It's, there is there, there is a positive effect of the Dunmar varnish in stabilizing condition, actually. But um, Dunmar varnish, though, is not not the, although not the perfect uh, suitable coating. They're still studying on what particular coating must be applied in scene in scene paintings. I mean, in, in, when wall, when paintings done on steel, uh, a further technical study is being done to uh, come up with a more um, suitable protective coating for these uh, paintings on steel. This cross-section full micrography of that painting, Santarita de Casilla, shows the layer of damar varnish applied right over the paint layer. And right below is the corroded steel canvas. So how do you conserve a paint, a painting, where the canvas is already deteriorating as well? And it's it's a very complex, complicated study, and uh, they're still they're still very hopeful that uh, they should be able to come up with a strategy on how to stabilize the uh, or or slow down the rate of corrosion and protect the paintings as well. This uh, technical graph uh, of showing the temperature and relative humidity of the Quarloff market climate in, in San Sebastian recorded in a span of 12 months back in 2011. The red line uh, there shows uh, the threshold at which uh, the paintings are still protected. And beyond that, uh, uh, beyond that line, paintings will start to deteriorate. And the graph shows that temperature and humidity are beyond the optimal range, are way beyond the, the threshold. So you can just imagine the, uh, the effect uh, over the years. So, um, one, of my, uh, one of my friends in, 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 in San Sebastián, Christine Legge, uh, uh, has helped me, um, from, uh, has helped me with my study. He, she, she shared some insights in her study uh, funded by the University of Melbourne. And she, they're still doing a, a very extensive survey of the paintings. And as you can imagine, these projects are very much costly. Yeah. This this can this this project only can cost millions. Can can the, can our parishes or the, uh, can our parishes afford such projects? Well, uh, in in terms of conservation, of course, we have to consider as well the resources that we have. So there is really a the, an emphasis we, we need to emphasize. A careful, um, the, you know, the careful planning and plotting a, a conservation plan in order to mitigate the risks involved in, in, in such projects. And I need to emphasize as well how important it is to uh, have a guided conservation professional to make a good assessment of these, uh, of these works, to, to uh, make a decision for the stakeholders of the projects. So, I'll show a particular project being done in Albur right now. They're still finishing uh, most of the, uh, uh, of the of the ceiling in, in Albur Church, being led by Guy Pistolio and uh, an artist in the, in a, um, uh, an urna maker. Uh, it, it's it's pretty uh, it, it's pretty uh, amusing and, and also. Uh, I'm very relieved to, uh, to you know that it's a very big concerted effort by both the, the parish uh, people and, uh, and, and, the, and the priests and, and several other agencies to, uh, to work on the reconstruction of the paintings. Most of the uh, panels have, have, been, have uh, fallen down back in 2009 because the, the roof system had been very decrepit, have uh, been neglected. So in, uh, uh, 
a small storm caused um, a large portion of the roof to fall down. So they decided instead of you know doing a more costly conservation, they just decided to you know, bring down some parts and put up new ones, copy from um, from the original works by Franz. I'll show you some before and after pictures. This uh, picture of Van der Linde's picture of uh, Agony the Garden. This is now how it looks like today. <coughs> this uh, illusionistic dome using the animal poses technique by Kreisha. This is now how it looks like today. Um, some of you might be cringing. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, see, they, although they cannot really salvage everything, what's important for these parishes is to realize the, per the real objective of these paintings. These are not, you know, painted only for art's sake. There has to be special meaning, especially for the parish and for the, uh, for the viewer as well. How the priest wants to uh, evangelize in his accents. So uh, another um, 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 very noble initiative being done in in, uh, in El Bor is now they're not uh, yeah, they're, they're not this um, they're not discarding all the, all France works. In fact, what they did in some some parts that were salvaged, they uh, they flattened them with the sledge, they really touched some of the works, they cleaned it, and they placed it in wooden frames, and they hang and they hang those uh, paintings on the, uh, along, uh, uh, on the walls inside. So that they would still be able to, they would still be able to perpetuate the memory of the artist. Very good initiative by by El Bur. In the in the Pacific and Taal, um, over the years, only the apse area, uh, the, the apse area have have um, have been preserved. The original work by Caribbean de Long Antillon, uh, still there, but over the years, the, uh, the transit and the neighbor have been whitewashed. So in 2012. Monsignor Fredman Lambayan commissioned the project to uh, to re uh, reconstruct the, uh, the, paint the paintings by copying or replicating the styles, the quadratura and the grise styles done by Kirik and replicated around the the, the, uh, the the transit and the nave. Now, you, you do these projects, you do these restoration works, but you don't spend all your resources, all your money, on, on just one project at the expense of the rest, at the expense of the maintenance of the, ch of the church structure. Remember, most or the main reasons why ceiling paintings are, are uh, deteriorating is mainly because of the church structure itself. In this uh, example in, in Bulhoi, one of the biggest problems in, in the ceiling paintings is uh, that most dark areas have been uh, roosted by bats and birds, which, you know, they get to one. It's very highly acidic and it damages and destroys the, uh, the paintings. A very, very big portion of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the uh, sanctuary have been, uh, have been lost because of the bats that are roosting. So what they did is uh, they first prepared, uh, they first prepared the, um, the windows. They put the mesh, uh, mesh wires so that bats cannot enter anymore. And what they also did um, is, uh, this was a, only a suggestion done back in last year, which you know, it, it was, um, was uh, realized. Uh, they tried to use a speaker system, which emits ultra-high frequency waves, sound waves, that, uh, will very, that will be very annoying or irritating to bats and birds, and will drive, they'll drive them away within a, within a radius. It's usually a technology being done in airports to drive away bats and, and, and birds in runways. It's interesting to know that this speaker technology, originally intended for airports, have found its way to a more noble project in seeding conservation. That's what they did in Bologna. That's uh, they, they, they uh, yeah, the father, I think, are you here? Some <laughs> Thank you, father. So, yeah. Mga pangkuling salita. A lot of our churches still have these beautiful paintings. A lot of them have also been lost. For 
churches that still have these very beautiful paintings, I wish you got, um, I wish you still preserve them. For those who have lost and want to uh, do restorations, please ask, uh, please ask the uh, people who will be able to uh, contribute to, uh, we have a big network here who will be able to help um, do a, a more informed and more guided restoration project for these, uh, for these scene paintings. For those uh, who don't have these paintings but who want to have their own uh, painting as well, like in Katanawa, where uh, it originally there was no painting at all, they just uh, did it recently. I hope you uh, get inspiration by the Holy Spirit in creating these new forms of art. After all, these scene paintings, they're not just made for art's sake. These paintings are inviting us to partake into the sacred and the divine. Jesus once said to uh, his disciples inside the temple, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift your heads for your touch of joy in life. All for the great glory of God, and I'm Sanamako.